Hi, I'm Scott Allen Miller, and today on today's Sam IT, I want to talk about a topic that came up with one of my IT peers today in conversation. We were talking about working from home and providing computers and other resources for workers who work from home, and he was surprised because he knows that I'm a very strong proponent for working from home, but I am not a strong proponent for providing computers and many of the resources that people use at home, at least not by default. He felt that this was a strange combination, given I am absolutely so strongly in favor of allowing people to work from home whenever possible. My own company works from home nearly 100%. Now, when I say I don't want to provide computers and other resources at home, generally I'm talking about markets like the US, Canada, UK, places where people really do have the resources to have those things at home if you're working in a really low cost environment, such as uh, um, Guatemala or the Philippines or Vietnam, then providing those resources for people at home is probably a different conversation. But in a market where trained knowledge workers can universally and easily afford that technology, where the technology is cheap and the ability to uh, uh, afford it is high, then that's what we're really talking about here. So what is my logic? My logic is this. Knowledge workers who are going to work from home are generally going to already have computers, desks, a workspace, internet connections, and so forth. And quite honestly, if they don't, that's something you may want to consider. And of course, you may want to consider putting this information into an interview. We're making you an offer. Here's a th here are things that contingently and contingently we expect you to have, right? We simply expect anyone, and especially working in IT, which is our field, right? the expectation is you're going to have a computer and internet. If you work in IT and don't have a computer and internet at home, honestly, that should be the first question in the interview. How good is your computer and internet at home? Oh, I don't have one. Okay, thank you. Uh, you're probably not someone we want, right? Not that it's wrong not to have these things at home, but honestly, have you ever met someone who worked in pretty much any field that was a great candidate and had no interest in what they did outside of work? Once in a while, there is a slight chance that you will find someone in some field where that is true. But even if you're a chemist, your chances are you're gonna have an amazing lab at home or in some private space. Maybe you don't wanna blow up your house. But pretty much every field, if you're a woodworker by trade, chances are you're gonna have woodworking stuff at home. Maybe not as much as at the office, maybe 10 times as much, right? When you're passionate about anything, if you're the people you want to hire in pretty much any field, some amount of it is going to go home with you. More importantly, it's gonna be something that you do as part of your life. Working in IT, we have an expectation that people are gonna be passionate about the job because there are plenty of passionate people about IT in the world that we never have to consider someone who isn't passionate. There are enough people who love doing this job and will excel at it that they're the only ones you have to consider. Other fields, maybe that gets less common, right? If you're an insurance actuary, I totally understand that you may love math but not go home and do anything to do with insurance. I get that. The thing that you're passionate about, though, is probably math and statistics, not not insurance. And it's actually actuarism <laughs> is the thing you're interested in, not the insurance. Just like in IT, yeah, I may not do exactly the same thing at home that I do at work, but it certainly involves computers and the Internet and businesses and technology and, and similar things with networking and all that. So... Within reason, we have a really good reason to expect that people are going to have some amount of things at home. And almost, no matter what it is you're interested in as a knowledge worker, chances are having a computer of some sort, having an internet connection of some sort is going to be useful to you to the point where they're, they're non-starters for having them across the board. Simple things in life, if you're going to shop online, if you're going to look up articles on Wikipedia, whether it's you're doing your job or you're just editing a photo or editing videos, things that I like to do, looking up Wikipedia articles, taking an interest in almost anything, chances are you're going to do it on a computer with the internet or you're going to do it better with a computer and the internet. And even if the only thing you do is shop on Amazon, there's a really good chance that you will do it so, so much more quickly and be able to do so much more comparative shopping and price matching and all those things with a computer that it will pay for having it. And so not having a computer, not having an internet connection outside of the most unbelievably poor in the first world nations, 
just doesn't make sense. And people will argue, well, well you could do it with an iPad. Okay, you can do it with an iPad that's more expensive than most computers. You can get a pretty decent computer for $70 uh, and you still have to have the internet access, right? Those things aren't going away. So expecting that people have them as a baseline isn't unreasonable. Now, does that mean we would never pay for those things if someone came and said, look, I know everyone else has them, but I don't. I'm still a good candidate. I just, these aren't things I have and I'm unwilling to pay for them like everyone else there's still room for maybe the company should pay for that. And if you have a situation where you have lots of workers who maybe that's a hardship, great, pay for that universally, right? But for most people, the average person, the, the 90 percentile, all those people under the 90, they don't want their work computer at home. I don't want a work phone. I don't want to have to carry a phone in my pocket that I'm beholden to in addition to my own phone. I don't want to carry a laptop to and from an office. I don't want to have to store and secure company data inside my house on a computer. I don't want to have to have that in the way. I want to choose what I'm going to use. I want to put it in a place I want to put it. I want to get the internet service that I want. I want to do all those things. And then, yeah, I use it for work because they're already the things that I chose. I like the operating system that I'm running. I like how I set it up. I like the screens that I bought. I like the desk that I have. I like the chair that I'm in. All those things are custom for me and I'm spending money on the things that matter to me, not what the company chose for me. So for most people, since you're already gonna have those, of the candidates you're most interested in for knowledge workers, right? Your laborers are different, right? You're getting, but even, you know, a plumber, even an electrician, they're gonna wanna research things and that computer's gonna make sense. So they do not qualify for the don't have computers people, right? I understand that they're generally not gonna work from home, so the point may be moot, but unless you're talking about like a janitor who has no reason to ever research anything for their job or for life in general, okay, they may not have a computer at home. If you want them to do something from home that would require a computer, you may have to provide it and that's reasonable. In the old days, like in the 1980s, 1990s, when I was first working, it was assumed that for most jobs, sometimes they would tell you, but it was assumed that you would have to have a car and a driver's license and you would have to drive to work. If you didn't, it was expected that someone else would provide a car for you and drive you to work. One way or another, you were being driven to work at great cost. And that was considered a reasonable expectation. That expectation is so much higher and so much more unreasonable than letting you work from home and just expecting you to have a reasonable baseline environment of the technology that honestly you should normally have for most people. I'm not saying that there's a should have for technology, but if you're a knowledge worker, if you want to be advancing in your field, if you're doing continuous education, taking an interest in what you do, almost always it's going to be so above and beyond obvious that you need to have a computer and internet for that to do it effectively that this is a reasonable baseline. But lots and lots and lots of people throughout the decades have had no reason to own a car except to get to and from an office. And that was reasonable in an era where most of those people had no way to work from home. But now that you have the ability to work from home, expecting people to have a car, expecting people to commute when there's nothing in the office that needs you, when you could do your job from home, that is beyond unreasonable and does not service the needs of the business. But this does not become 100% the, the requirement of the business, the duty of the job to provide for every possible working contingency. It's just not reasonable to require the business to provide everything. Once you're expecting them to provide internet and computer, are you also expecting them to provide your cell phone? Everyone has a cell phone. That makes no sense for them to provide. Do they have to provide your desk, your chair, your house, the land it's built on? The electricity, where does it end? Once we're getting to the normal boilerplate objects of life, it becomes a little bit weird when we start expecting our jobs to supply them. Obviously, we're gonna have electric for our house. Obviously, we're gonna have internet so we can watch Netflix. Obviously, we're gonna have most of these things. Somebody may not have a computer, but almost everyone is who's going to be a valuable knowledge worker. Having the company rebuy all of those things simply makes no sense. And there's an additional underlying principle here that is very important and we need to discuss. Because on one hand, we're simply looking at, well, whose duty is it to provide these things? And I apologize for the fireworks. 
yes, if the company wants you to do work, they're going to need to provide an environment that lets you do work. And there are some things that make no sense for you to have at home. And absolutely, I think a company should supply. For my business, we put desk phones on the desks of every single worker at home, every single one of them. And we like to have a certain level of firewall at home. Any employee who wants one, we simply ship them a hardware firewall. It's that simple. We want them to have it. If they'd like it, we pay for it. No questions asked. It's done. If you are going to have a desk phone, unless you have a reason not to get one, we expect you to have one. We don't expect you to pay for it. We ship it to you, right? We set it up. It's not something you would have as a normal home user. Why would you have a phone like that? And why would you hook it to our network, right? That's not a reasonable expectation. It would be yours. When we do bring your own computers, we're not expecting people to install software on them. We're not expecting them to do anything that makes them any less theirs. They're bringing their own and doing anything they want. For us, that's why we often provide computers because we work in places, sorry for the car alarms, all the fireworks are setting off car alarms. The, uh, when we want to have control, when we want to have monitoring, when we want to make sure that people can be in places where it's hard to get resources, we supply them. That's reasonable. So I am paying for these things on a regular basis for my employees. But when it comes to working in the U.S. in places where it's easy and cheap for people to have those things and they, I expect that they should have them already, paying for them again just to punish the employer to give the impression that we're doing something good for the worker isn't smart. It's not good business and it just doesn't make sense. But now I want to talk about this really key uh, economic concern. When we do things like pay for an employee's electricity, or let's just say we're paying for their internet. We have an employee who wasn't going to have internet, and so we have to pay for it for them. That's okay, and sometimes that's necessary. So let's assume it is necessary in this case. Their internet, we'll just say, is going to cost $100 per month. One way or another, either that employee or other employees are paying that $100 per month. That is always going to be the case. No matter how you look at it, one way or another, that is coming out of the total employee compensation package. Maybe you're averaging it against all employees and everyone's suffering, but that doesn't make sense because that would simply encourage your employees who are paying for themselves to go find another job. So logically, you would attempt to punish the employee who's requiring you to pay for it by about the same amount, right? So they're going to earn $100 less a month. For tax reasons, there can be great reasons to manipulate these numbers. Oh, we'll pay for your computer, we'll pay for your mortgage, we'll pay for your electric, we'll pay for your internet, because you don't have to pay taxes on it, we don't have to pay taxes on it, and there's a huge benefit to that. If that applies to you, great, do that. Work that out with your employer. Reduce your salary by that amount and gain on the taxes. That's fine, that's a different thing, but when we're asking for a benefit, I want this benefit paid for by the company, that has to come out of the compensation package. It has to. You just have to think about how a business works. Right? That's the place where it's going to come from. So when we do these things, we are manipulating employees or employees are manipulating the companies. Right? What happens is companies will say, oh, we'll provide you a computer, we'll provide you a phone, we'll provide... It looks like they're doing such a good job, but your salary is going down by those amounts. The company also will is unlikely to invest in the same level of computers that you will, not monetarily, but in quality. When you're buying for yourself, you're going to think about the things that matter to you, and that's what you're going to invest in. So you're going to get something that you enjoy, that, that makes you happy, that's a good value that you're going to protect. But when they provide, they're going to look at standardization and the, what was easy for them to, to get where they are, right? So they may spend more than you would spend. They may get something that doesn't match what you want. Maybe they're going to get you a Mac, but what you really wanted was Windows or vice versa. It doesn't matter, right? They're going to do all these things, and then it's theirs. They're going to control it. They're not going to let you play video games on it. They're not going to let you, you know, just take it to wherever you want to go, do anything you want with it, wipe it when you want to wipe it. That's not going to be up to you because it's theirs, and now you're just using it for work. At the end of the day, it's the employees who lose in this situation, not the business. Some businesses give out these things because it gives them more control over their employees. And honestly, some schools do it because it gives them monitoring over students that would otherwise be illegal. It's probably still illegal, but they do it anyway, right? It gives you the ability to track. It gives you the ability to monitor. It gives you the ability to sue in many cases. Those are not things that me as an employee would want. 
right? I do not want my employer giving me devices like that because it makes no sense. It doesn't benefit me and it only benefits them if they are looking at something nefarious. But 90% of the time, it simply screws us both over because for me, it's a perception. Oh, it seems like such a great job. They gave me all these things. It's above and beyond my salary. No, my salary is lower because of those things. And to the company, right? They simply see it as part of the compensation package. Oh, this is how much the employee cost. Add it to the pool, right? So if you're in a place that spreads that cost out and you're not the one getting it, you need to go get it because you're paying for it one way or another. And if you're not at a company that's spreading it out, well, that's fine if someone else is opting for that impression, but it also implies that they're not the smartest negotiator. They're coming up with a way for you to spend too much and get too little for it and ending up with a lower compensation package, not a good financial indicator of their decision-making ability. So it doesn't look good for anybody right? When it's needed, it's needed and it's okay for businesses to do. But logically, it does not make a lot of sense. This is not a, we're going to be a good company and provide these things. That is not how this works. It is not an indicator of being at a good company. It is an indicator of being a company that either hires a lot of people who need extra support because they're not at the level we would expect for a lot of knowledge workers, and that's fine. Maybe you are at a company that simply does a lot of manual labor and knowledge worker is not what they do or it indicates a company that's looking to manipulate the employees by giving the impression of a good compensation package without the reality. Maybe it's still a decent compensation package, but they're trying to make it look better than it actually is. Or they're a company that's trying to, to influence and maintain a level of control outside of their own environment. None of those are great things, and it could be a combination of them. None of them are absolutely terrible, but none of them are things you want to go out and, and ask for. So because of all those reasons, while I am the biggest proponent of work from home that you will ever meet, I have been fighting for work from home from, since the 90s, and my own companies have always been work from home anytime it is possible. I am also a proponent of your workers almost always providing their own baseline of equipment unless you have a specific need where bring your own equipment is not going to cut it for you, whether it's security or control or requ legal requirements or whatever, that's okay. But when you have that option and take it for bring your own equipment, it's going to make far more sense for your business, far more sense for the interest of the employee who's pushing you to provide those things to not provide them. Let your employees pay for them if you're going to do anything, give them a stipend so that they're still encouraged to spend wisely and to take care of the equipment because you also have the problem that when the company pays for equipment, employees are less likely to take care of it diligently. And that means cost goes up again. And then you're stuck with, are you self-insuring? Are you getting insurance? It's a mess. I'm pretty passionate <laughs> about the benefits of letting employees have their own equipment and then they can build the offices that make sense for them. Thanks for joining me. Please remember to like and subscribe and I will see all of you next time. Everyone, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video and for all of you who have been supporting this channel over the many years that we have been here. I'm working really hard to get this channel back on track and get videos coming out on a regular basis. And part of that is something we've never done before and that is give you guys a way to support the channel. It would be amazing if you wanted to do that, whether it's something as simple as giving it a like, a subscribe, and sharing with your friends, telling your coworkers or your boss or your company about it, all of that would be fantastic. For those who want to do a little bit more, you can buy me a coffee. Down in the links below, I have a link where you can go and support me directly. Any coffees that you buy is money that comes directly to me, so that's a great way to support the channel directly. You can also buy my book. Not all of you are aware, but I recently wrote Linux Administration Best Practices, and that is available on Amazon. That link will be below as well. That would mean a lot to me if you guys went out and purchased that. That really does help quite a bit. And for those who are looking for more than this channel does as a YouTube channel, I am a consulting CIO, and those that are interested can go to ntg.co. And that is where I've been for the last 23 years as a researcher, as an engineer, as a consulting uh, information technology and operations director for companies of all types and sizes all around the world. If Whether you need just a little bit of consulting, you need some advice on a project, or you're looking for someone to actually oversee all the operations of your company from a business infrastructure perspective, we offer all of that. Please reach out sales at ntg.co. 
we would love to speak to you about what we can offer. Thanks so much for watching the show. I will see all of you next time.